Samantha Prabhu. I'm from Washington University in St. Louis, and I'm the uh, chair of the BCVS Specialty Program Committee, and I'm joined by Farah Sheikh, University of California, San Diego. I'm vice chair of the meeting. And we have the distinct pleasure today of uh, talking to uh, Dr. Eric Olson, who is the uh, 2023 BCVS uh, keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Olson, uh, I think, is known to all as a, uh, a distinguished scientist, a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he's currently the founding director of the uh, uh, Department of Molecular Biology at, at UT Southwestern. And uh, we wanted to uh, uh, talk to Dr. Olson and uh, get his uh, perspectives on, on science, uh, trainee development, uh, future trends, and maybe I could start off uh, Eric, uh, maybe we go back to the beginning and... Uh, That's a long way back. <laughs> tell us uh, about your career path, how you got into science, who were your mentors, how did things align that you, uh, you know, entered into the fast lane of discovery and uh, what can we learn from your, your path? I was always interested in science uh, my entire life and I was especially interested in discovering new things, pushing on the envelope of knowledge, uh, writing, uh, I'd say, my own path. And that's what led me into science. Uh, what I didn't anticipate necessarily going into science would be the uh, gratification that uh, I would get from training the next generation of young scientists. And I would have to say that seeing the success of my trainees over the past decades uh, has really been uh, one of the unexpected joys of this career in science. You know, you are known to everybody as a, uh, how would I describe it, as a translational molecular biologist that focuses on the heart and, and muscle. And uh, one of the things that's distinctive about your career is the, is the pace of discoveries uh, that come through your lab. So when you look at it from the outside, I'm wondering, how do you decide on your scientific questions? What, what's the approach that you take, um, is, it, is it a linear path or uh, how, how are you developing your hypotheses? Uh, I wouldn't say that I had a, a particularly well thought out strategy. <laughs> I would say that I always try to uh, avoid the crowd if I can. So if I see that an area is getting too crowded, I'll try to strike out in a new direction. Uh, there's a, a test that one often hears about. It's referred to as the deletion test. Mm -hmm. uh, the deletion test is if you deleted yourself, would the field be any different? And I try to apply that to myself all the time and ask, are the things that I'm trying to do unique and different, or is, are they redundant with what other people are doing? So, uh, And I would say that uh, new technologies have uh, inspired uh, me and I've continually sought to find ways to apply the latest technologies to the next questions at hand. So I wanted to sort of go a little bit back to what Samanth was saying about mentorship. Who were your mentors? Who do you feel, you know, you've done so much for so many. Who do you feel, um, were there some key people in your, you know, in your career that sort of led you in the right path? That's a good question. My postdoctoral mentor was uh, Dr. Louis Glazer at Washington University. He was a great mentor to me. And then I uh, started my first position at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. And my chairman was Dr. William Lenars. And I learned a lot about leadership from him. And when Dr. Lenars uh, left MD Anderson, I uh, replaced him as the chairman of the department. And I really built on the lessons that I'd learned from him. Later in my career, I was recruited to UT Southwestern by uh, Joe Goldstein and Michael Brown, and uh, they have continued to be my close uh, friends and, and mentors to this day, so I've learned a lot from watching their success. Tremendous. Um, you know, you are very well <clears throat> known for discovering multiple novel pathways in both uh, cardiac and muscle development and uh, 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 disease mechanisms. It may be a hard question, but I wanted to ask you, what is the discovery of which you are most proud? Oh boy, it's a, the, the, I would say that uh, it's difficult to uh, pinpoint one discovery uh, since the trainees in my lab have made so many. 
uh, I would say what, what I'm most proud of is the uh, blueprint of uh, development that has arisen from the many gene regulatory proteins that we've discovered in my lab. Uh, we've found many new genes, and I always tell my trainees, what I'm most interested in is discovering new things and uh, finding new genes, naming them, and imprinting them on the field. And so uh, those are the things that I'm uh, most proud of, and I think probably will be our most long-lasting contribution. So I was also intrigued by your forging ahead in the cutting edge like space for technologies. CRISPR-Cas and all of those are at the forefront now for patients and precision medicine. Um, I was just curious um, what your thoughts are on you know, meeting some of these challenges that are going ahead, that in terms of really translating it to patients and what your thoughts are, because you've been, you know, published quite a few papers in this area recently. So as I alluded to earlier, I'm most interested in pushing on the frontiers, doing what's not been done before. And although I am a basic scientist, I think many of the things that we've discovered can uh, be applied to human disease. Mm -hmm. And so, when the, the ad, with the advent of CRISPR, I felt that this was an entirely new era in which we could really uh, try to do what had not been done before and try to uh, deploy gene editing tools to remove mutations that cause cardiovascular disease. And so I've been especially excited about that. You cannot uh, develop a, a therapeutic in an academic lab. Right. So academic labs are meant for discovery and sort of organized chaos mm -hmm. with <laughs> students. Great. <laughs> but, and that's really the, the engine for uh, therapeutic development, but one can't develop a therapy in a lab. It has to be done in a very systematic, organized way in the context of a company, and that's why I've been involved in trying to launch several companies along the way. So let me, let me uh, build on that. So the theme of uh, the intersection between academia and entrepreneurship, the, uh, the idea of how to uh, commercialize, uh, perhaps, uh, discovery. What, what advice do you give, uh, well, not just trainees, but colleagues, as to how to uh, have a broader impact on your discoveries in the, uh, in the lab uh, to a, a, a different venue? Well, I think pursuing science is a very personal uh, undertaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, one has to understand your own uh, preferences, strengths, uh, and weaknesses, and uh, go from there. Some people uh, thrive on the unknown. Some people would rather work on the details of the known. Uh, as a mentor, that's really my challenge, is to figure out where people's strengths and weaknesses lie and to direct them uh, in the, the appropriate uh, direction. So I, I think it's... There's no one recipe for success in science, so one really has to understand yourself uh, and uh, where your greatest motivations uh, come from. From a practical standpoint, would you have any advice on potential pitfalls? And you founded, and I think you and your colleagues have founded multiple companies. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> what, what advice would you give? <laughs> My one piece of advice is be uh, intensely rigorous, particularly when you're trying to develop a therapy. Everything is based on the rigor of the foundation that you are laying. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's easy to look at things through rose-colored glasses and yeah. maybe embellish things, but I think at the end of the day you've got to be rock solid in, uh, in the science because if there's any shakiness to the science it will come back to haunt you later. Thank you. Can you give us a little bit of insight? I know with the title that you chose for your keynote, Thinking Big and Thinking Small, are you um, giving us a preview of something new or, or what are your, um, yeah, you have innovative titles, I feel, so <laughs> that's all. <laughs> well, I, you know, I didn't know what to give as my title, so I, I was thinking big, you know, we're all thinking big, but I'm also working on the biggest gene in the human genome, that's dystrophin. Oh, mm. right. Exactly. And then I'm thinking small. We've discovered a whole family of small proteins, and we're right. also thinking small from the largest gene down to the smallest letter of the DNA. So try to cover the full spectrum. Well, that, I think that summarizes your, your career right? <laughs> yes. in a nutshell. Let me, let me ask you, uh, I was impressed with the number of trainees that have come out of your lab, and many of whom are now, you know, 
uh, in their own right, uh, distinguished scientists. Uh, do you have a, you mentioned that you tell your trainees you want to uh, really in, engage in discovery science, but what advice do you give your trainees as they develop their career? And uh, what, what, what's the formula you give them for success? I think to follow, uh, follow their instincts and figure out what, what motivates them. Uh, for me uh, and my trainees, I give everything away. So whatever they discover in my lab, they can take with them. I won't compete with them, and I'll enable them to be successful. That poses challenges for me, of course, because I've got to continually reinvent myself. But it, it also uh, has really been advantageous because it's forced me to keep moving and to keep looking for the next uh, big discovery uh, and rather than uh, resting on my laurels. And I, it's so uh, gratifying, as I've said, just to see the success of my trainees take the projects from our lab and move them in their own directions, which are different from where I would have potentially moved them. Great. Well, Vera, do you have a... Uh, no, I mean, I feel like you've, um, you know, we probably, there's a lot of people that are idolizing your whole career yeah. and path, and uh, I think well, it's really great to get well, some well, deep insights. Maybe on. I could ask a non-scientific question. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm a music buff. Oh, all right. <laughs> I love guitar music, so I, I, I see that you hold a Willie Nelson uh, endowed chair, yeah. and um, I wanted to ask you how you uh, merge music uh, uh, and uh, your band uh, in your life. Well, I grew up in a musical family, and uh, I had always idolized Willie Nelson. He was my musical hero. Mm -hmm. And living in Texas, you know, uh, Willie is the he is the heart and soul of Texas. And so I got to know Willie, and uh, Willie and his wife created an endowed chair to support my research. And I've played with him last summer. I played with Willie uh, in front of 20,000 people. Yeah. So I can tell you, giving a science talk is good, <laughs> but playing with Willie in front of 20,000 people takes it to a new level. Oh, gosh. Uh, so that's been uh, really uh, just a very exciting uh, dimension to my career that I, I couldn't have anticipated, and I'm really grateful for the support he's provided. And I, I would also say it's humbling to realize that no matter how much I work in the laboratory, People are always more interested in hearing about Willie Nelson, <laughs> so maybe we'll leave it at that. Well, uh, Eric, I want to thank you. Uh, congratulations on all your accomplishments, both yes. in and outside the lab. And uh, we are really looking forward to your uh, keynote lecture uh, this year. And uh, um, thank you for uh, uh, coming. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much.